Hello, my name is Scott Hajek, and I'm going to share with you a presentation that I gave at Green Plum Summit. I'll be speaking to you about a modern interface for data science on Postgres and Green Plum. I will describe to you a little bit more about myself, and then I will share that Pure SQL is not necessarily the preferred interface for sophisticated data scientists. But yet, SQL-based systems have a level of maturity and scale to them that are necessary for enterprise data science demands. Instead, what is popular is an abstraction called data frames that uh, it can be layered on top of SQL-based systems and in particular, I'll share about a package in Python that is an implementation of this abstraction for large data platforms, and it's called IBIS. So again, my name is Scott Hajek, and I've been doing data science consulting for over five years, um, and I'm with Pivotal Software as a senior data scientist. My specialties are in uh, linguistics and natural language processing. I've worked with customers from a variety of industries, including banking, telecommunications, and manufacturing, and I've tackled a wide array of problems, including entity resolution, information extraction, optimization, anomaly detection, and e-com surveillance. And throughout the course of this experience, I've, I've come to think of different personas, uh, different kinds of users who might be using a database system. You might, uh, one such user might be a database administrator, um, or maybe an application developer, or a business analyst. And in this presentation, I want to focus on the abstractions that are useful and necessary for, in particular type of user, data scientists. And a data scientist, uh, th this persona that I'm building, uh, they typically operate on large data sets interactively. They tend to use advanced statistics and machine learning techniques. And some data scientists can be sophisticated programmers, and they may appreciate good abstractions that help them focus on what's important uh, for their data science work. To get thinking about that, let's uh, about abstractions. Let's think about uh, what languages are the best for data science. Science, and on the internet, you may see a, a lot of debate around Python versus R as the best language for data science. So we're looking here at a couple of examples um, ab about how you might select certain records, uh, filtering for certain records in R and in Python. But I think there's a key player that's missing in this, um, in this head off for what's best for data science, and that is COBOL. So of course I'm joking here. Uh, COBOL is is a very uh, complicated language to do very basic operations in, and you see that by just this little snippet of the same uh, logic of trying to select for certain rows. Um, but my point here is sort of tongue in cheek is that um, it's that both Python and R are both very good for the, some, a lot of the operations needed in data science. And um, they both have abstractions called data frames, which I'll dig into more later. But I want to point out that it's not just about fewer lines of code. It's also just that it's easier to reason about at the level that is important or that at the level where you're focusing on data science. So let's go through some other ideas of abstractions that are helpful because this is the the core uh, message that I'm trying to, to, to talk about. Um, so for example in math uh, the notion of matrices it are it's an important concept. So it's uh, it makes for example multiple linear regression more digestible. So let's say you have y which is a column of your output uh, of, of the dependent variable that you're trying to predict. And then you have a, a matrix, so you have many different columns with uh, different values uh, in your x. And then you're trying to learn a model that is uh, a different 
uh, coefficients for each of those columns that we're seeing with the beta up there. So if it's simple linear regression, let's say you just have one column, then it's uh, a little bit easier. So you can note it by you know y equals ax a plus bx, and you know you just have one coefficient that you're dealing with. Um, but when you have multiple linear regression without matrix notation, then it gets pretty unwieldy if you have a lot of columns, because then you're writing out separate uh, beta and x for every single column you have. Whereas if you use matrix notation, then you just can express it as this y equals x times beta. And what comes along with matrix notation is this abstraction uh, or this uh, notion of how to multiply matrices. And how that works is you iterate through uh, a, a column and a row and you multiply uh, the corresponding x times the beta all the way through and sum those up and that is equivalent to uh, this this notation is y equals x b x beta um, so it just shows you how you can reason about things more compactly uh, with you with a right abstraction for tabular data um, there there are abstractions that are also important and in SQL itself is actually it is a good abstraction for for some levels of thinking about data the the benefits of it include that it's a well-defined standard it's very familiar within the enterprise it's a declarative language which means that you don't have to worry about the implementation details you just specify the uh, properties of the output that you want um, there are analytical operations available in it um, there are abstractions for tables, columns, and you know, windows for, for aggregation. Uh, but unfortunately, though, it's quite verbose, and it's also difficult, difficult to compose complex queries and transformations by hand. Um, now, there are some uh, things that can help you with that in uh, Postgres in particular, um, such as the procedural language extensions for Python and R, you know, can help you with some complex transformations, and also the Madlib machine learning library uh, also have a lot of utility functions in there to assist with those complex queries. Um, but uh, also note that um, you know, just re representing all these complex queries and intermediate result sets is is a little challenging in SQL. Now, data frames, as I mentioned, is a it's a tabular data structure that is uh, very popular. Its popularity can be uh, seen as a via a testament of many languages that have independently evolved to have them, including Python with its pandas package, uh, the R language, and Apache Spark, all of which over time has, have evolved data frames abstractions. So it's easy to represent um, different kinds of data in different columns. Um, they're named columns. It's easy to select a subset of the columns. There are a lot of analytical operations available. Um, and it's popular with data scientists um, in particular because it easily hooks into these programming languages. Uh, it's flexible for interactive data exploration. And it's easy to represent subqueries or uh, sub uh, steps in a processing pipeline as variables. And that gives you a clear flow of data through pipelines um, in an interactive way. Another abstraction that, uh, that data scientists try to get towards, and the reason for needing uh, this higher level abstraction at the tabular level, is because what they care about is building models. And to, for example, uh, some abstractions in a popular machine learning library called scikit-learn in Python um, is shows you how these abstractions are, are very helpful. So in this case, any classifier or model that you have in this uh, framework uh, will have a fit method that takes in um, an X, uh, which is the matrix of your input data, and a Y, which is your, your vector of values that you're trying to predict. And that generates a trained model that then you can do a, a dot predict uh, method. So that's a, an abstraction that 
no matter what the kind of model it was, it'll always have um, these operators here, these methods. So coming back to SQL and the challenges that, that come with it. Um, so again, why might uh, some people not want to write it directly? Um, app developers, for example, often will try to use frameworks to avoid writing it directly because it can be tedious and error prone, especially if you're doing a lot of dynamic query generation. And if you, it can be insecure if you're doing a string concatenation uh, subject to SQL injection. Also, if you're gearing your syntax towards a specific flavor of SQL, then, um, then you might have to do a significant rewrite if you end up changing the underlying databases in the future. So their approach has been to use uh, tools such as object relational mapping tools to generate the SQL uh, dynamically, but in a safe way. Some examples of, of tooling that exists include Spring or Active Record from Ruby on Rails. So you may have heard, heard of some of these and you realize that it's um, valued by app developers. So at the same time, I've said that relational database management systems have a lot to offer. They're incredibly stable because they've had many years of development behind them. Um, and SQL is the most common and familiar language in the enterprise, so that's a benefit. The analytical capabilities that are there, and also for massively parallel processing variants, um, they offer massive scale both in the storage and the processing. So how can we bring the benefits of SQL-based platforms, but with, uh, while at the same time providing a level of abstraction that's helpful for the data scientist persona? Now in Python, uh, the answer could be IBIS. IBIS is a package that um, in its uh, own description of itself, it is a pandas-like deferred expression system with first-class SQL support. Let's break that down a little bit. Pandas is a Python package with data frames abstraction, it, which is a, a staple for data scientists these days. So it mimics that. The, also, the same code can work on multiple platforms. Um, the deferred expression system is what it's, what it's referring to is lazy evaluation. This means that you can define complex pipelines of transformations uh, represented as an object. And you can inspect the properties of that without actually running the query. So this allows for error checking or type checking on the client side before even sending the job to the cluster or to the server. This way it can help you make your bad code fail fast. There's nothing worse than sending a query and having it run for an hour before then the system finally f figures out that there's some problem. Also, it gives the uh, query execution um, optimizer the full picture. Uh, because otherwise, with big data processing pipelines, you might, uh, in order to make it interactive, you might build up uh, pieces of the pipeline as separate queries and write them to intermediate tables and so forth. But this, this way, it gives the optimizer the full plan, the full information to make a better plan. And lastly, uh, I'll just note that this was developed by Wes McKinney um, and others um, who were instrumental in creating the Pandas package that is so popular today. So it, is, it was created by the same people who know how to write abstractions that data scientists like. Let me show you just a few examples of IBIS in action. So you can create a connection object which then you use to refer to a table, for example, um, in this case, the, uh, a test table. And then from that, it goes ahead and fetches information about the structure of the table. Um, so it knows what the column names are and the, the types. And then you can do operations on it, like selecting a column, which using this brace notation looks very much like uh, pandas. You can also, it has methods for some uh, basic aggregations and computations. Um, but note that the computation itself is deferred until uh, the, 
when it's actually needed and when the execution is actually called for. So up until then, on the left, what we're seeing is it can produce this diagram of the steps that it will take, but not until you call execute on it does it actually compute the results. You can also do joins in an object-oriented fashion. So we can create another table object and then have a join between those two table objects defining the columns and, and how it's doing it. And again, this produces an object that represents those processing steps. Um, and we see it in this diagram that's generated. Um, but it doesn't actually compute the results. So before even computing the results, we know uh, the, the columns that will be available in that resulting um, object and the, their types. We can get even more complicated, so we can, um, on this joined object, we can uh, select certain columns from the source tables, uh, also uh, do operations in uh, you know, multiplying certain columns and so forth. We can do computations on that. And again, it's represented as an object that then can be rendered as this diagram. And also, um, we can, it gives you an, a way for generating, showing what the query that is generated from this whole process will be. Uh, so you can inspect that. So it's not that we're avoiding SQL entirely. It's still using it under the hood, but it allows us to reason about that SQL with using sort of the visual abstractions that are helpful for data science. Now, IBIS is still a, a new package, so there are some areas where it still needs some fleshing out to be able to cover the full range of data science tasks. So, for example, it needs still to have the ability to create and use user-defined functions. Those are, uh, in my experience at, uh, at Pivotal, we often use the UDFs to, to get our jobs done. It also requires the ability to create a table and save results to it. Um, now that's you know um, pretty pretty straightforward need there, and the data science modeling abstractions um, that could use that those objects from IBIS would be very helpful. So for example, if there's a, an equivalent to Scikit-Learn that with the dot fit method could take in an IBIS object and uh, as the input. So I'd like for this to be a call to action. I think this package, IBIS, has a lot going for it. It goes in the right direction of the abstractions that would make it even use easier for uh, data scientists to use Postgres and Greenplum. Um, and I hope this is a call to action for anyone else interested uh, in helping to flesh this out. It's an open source project that's out there, and we'd love some, some help improving it. So I hope that, that I've gotten you thinking about abstractions and gotten you excited about uh, gearing tool, the tools for using Postgres and Greenplum towards the data science scientist persona. Uh, and I'll le just leave you with these references to the project itself and, and some of the other tools um, and resources that I've mentioned. Thank you very much.